the idea of, of beginning to reaffirm the, the value of, of many of the personal art that we have at home, I think is a wonderful, it's a beautiful concept. Of, I know Lupe and I have had an altar in our home for uh, 12, 13 years now, and, and when we did it, it was, uh, it was an affirmation of something we had both experienced as children, you know, and, uh, and of course it's an expression of our religious belief as well as our, our cultural belief. And it isn't just a little altar, it's a big altar. Uh, and that comes from the cultural thing. Let me say that uh, a lot of my art at, to begin with, and this is really to reaffirm some of the things that people are saying, uh, started out as, as a response to uh, my own feelings of being alien in California. I had to deal with the fact that I felt like a goddamn alien and I was born here. And I was born in Deleno. And so that seemed like an ultimate absurdity, but the only way to solve it for me was to go back and to reassert the value of those things that were held, um, uh, that were despised, it seemed to me, by the society around me. So I went back and reaffirmed Lo Rascuache. I went back and, uh, even though I'd been through the college and the university and done all that jazz, I went back and became a campesino. And it was both hard and very easy to do this. And it was, it was both hard and very easy to throw all my university training out and, and to just to do it teatro a la, a la chingada, you know, just to do it with the campesinos. Um, but it was important to do it that way because I was getting something from it. I was getting a sense of my own value and worth as a human being. Uh, and so, because for some reason I still feel like a criminal and I'm made to feel like a criminal. Every time I walk into, uh, into a place where there aren't any Chicanos, I feel it. And I try not to, I try to be at ease uh, I'm old enough now to, to feel confident about walking in anywhere, but th that feeling is still there. And so now what I do is try to deal with it. Now, about uh, several years ago, a number of years ago, I, I decided to do something. Actually, it goes back to the 60s, even before the teatro. I decided that what I was going to do, what my task was, is that I was going to Mexicanize the United States. This seems like a tall order. It is. It's a difficult order. But I was going to go after these gavachos and Mexicanize the hell out of them, you see? And uh, I was going to try it through all means available. And I was going to use art, but it was going to be a cultural bullet that I was going to shoot into the base of the American brain. All right? In order to change. Uh, in order to do that, I have to find out where they live. And I have to find out where I live, too. Because we're really talking about some kind of human sensibility here. Not only theirs toward us, but us toward them. And uh, I realize that that can be interpreted as a very limited way to look at the universe, but then one life is all I've got, one life is all we've got to live this time around. So we do what we can. So for years now, I've been looking for the weak spots. I went to the Zoot Suit Riots because I felt that uh, that had been a case that had touched the national sensibility. Uh, that was, in fact, how the image of the Latino as street punk got impregnated into the media because the Sleepy Lagoon case received more attention than any other case previous to that involving Latinos on a national scale. We were in Time magazine, we were, we, you know, we were in Life magazine, we were in newspapers around the country. But the news was there before, as Pedro saying. There was another experience, the Chicano experience started a long time ago. And these avenues are soft spots, let me tell you. Chicano art in California. We have a chain of 21 missions I know that that thought might be revolting to you because of what happened to the missions and who restored the missions. The native daughters of the Golden West restored the missions. But they are expressions of Chicano art that go back to the beginnings of this state as an Hispanic entity. That was taken away. The history of that is that they were built they were used, of course, to Christianize the Indians, and that's the whole story. Our relationship as Indians to the Indians here is a whole different question that needs investigation, and someday we'll begin to deal with it. We can't deal with it now, but it's there. All right? The Pomos and the, uh, the, the all of them, the Cost Costanoan Indians, the, all of them, the Miwaks, uh, they're all over the place. Anyway, the point is that we have a history here and a cultural expression here that predates certainly the 60s and predates the 20th century. I'm dealing with uh, Vasquez now. I'm really trying to deal with Tiburcio Vasquez. Uh, he's giving me a hell of a time, you know? 
They, it, took, it took 20 years to catch him, you know? <laughs> and, and, and it's hard to catch him. As a Chicano, one Chicano, the other to catch him. But what's interesting, let's say, compare Vasquez to Murrieta. Murrieta, as far as I can tell, is a myth. All right? He's a myth that was invented in American literature, written by an Indian to begin with, but certainly a myth, perpetrated by European literature, continued by Chilean literature, Spanish literature. It's a myth. Is that he was a cutthroat. That's what they're saying. The reason they love him in American literature is because he's a reflection of the very Americans that came here. Because out of revenge, the guy went around slitting throats. But if you really look into it, the real Joaquin Murrieta, the real Joaquin, killed more chinos than he did gringos. It's, it's, it's a rather strange thing, you know. But anyway, the, the dude was mythologized as part of California history and turned into this, this Hollywood figure. Now, Vasquez, on the other hand, was not. Vasquez was born in Monterey. Vasquez grew up here. Vasquez went to San Quentin. Vasquez escaped from San Quentin. Vasquez was a bandit for 20 years, as opposed to two months for Joaquin Murrieta. Two months for Joaquin Murrieta, compared to 20 years. Okay, what does that mean? That's a Chicano for you. Vasquez was a Chicano. Tiburcio Vasquez. And he was hanged in San Jose. And he had family all over the place. And when we did our version of, of, of Tiburcio Vasquez last summer, his great-grandniece came. And she sat underneath Vasquez's photograph, and it was the same face. It was amazing. Anyway, in other words, he's got ties. They go all the way back to the 19th century. All right. In other words, there's a section of California history, California culture, of Chicano expression that has to begin to be dealt with. Why? Because Gavachos respond to it. Because the cowboy myth, as it became evident through the, the, the sculptures of Luis Jimenez, is based entirely on the vaquero. And if anything means America to the world, it's the cowboy. And without the vaquero, I mean, I mean, it's the California vaquero, do you understand? Or the Texas vaquero, but it's our vaquero that became the cowboy. And we need to rescue that vaquero. Why? Because if you touch the cowboy, you touch the American sensibility. And if you touch the cowboy, you touch us. Country Western music, where does that come from? It comes from Mexican music. And anyway, there are images and images and images. If you touch these things in ourselves, you can touch them in the American experience, and they'll respond. You understand, it's a sensibility. It's a way to move masses of people. We have no contact yet with all those millions that come to see the missions in California. We are off to the sidelines. They still have Spanish days in Santa Barbara, and our campesinos are still off to the sidelines. We are part of the tie-in that'll link us back to those early Californios. Finally, let me just say this much. There was a moment in history, from about 1836 to 1848, when California was a free place. Suddenly, a generation of people that had been born here and raised here had all of this, and this was their country. And they were determining what this country was going to be. Sure, Monterey was feuding with Los Angeles for political control, but there was a moment of freedom, a moment of identity as Californios. They were no longer Mexicanos, they were no longer Spanish, they were Californios. And then, of course, the gold rush happened, the gringo onslaught came. Do you know why we're invisible today? Because there were only 10,000 Californios. Within a period of one year, in Northern California alone, there were 100,000 gold miners. The 100,000 gold miners swamped the 10,000 Spanish, Californios, and they became invisible. Within the space of one year, our people faded into nothing. And we're still there, even though we're millions now. We need to go back there and unravel that. We need to go back there and capture California for our people, as Californios and as Americans. I thought.